In his book, Explore the Bible, J. Sidlow Baxter includes a poem that he wrote about the faithfulness of God. He never fails the soul that trusts in him. Though disappointments come and hopes burn dim, he never fails. Though trials surge like stormy seas around, though testings fierce like ambush foes abound, yet this my soul with millions more has found, he never fails, he never fails. He never fails the soul that trusts in him, though angry skies with thunder clouds grow dim, he never fails. Though icy blasts, life's fairest flowers lay low, though earthly springs of joy all cease to flow, yet still tis true with millions more I know, he never fails, he never fails. He never fails the soul that trusts in him, though sorrow's cup should overflow the brim, he never fails. Though off the pilgrim way seems rough and long, I yet stand amid white, or yon white robe throng, And there I'll sing with millions more this song, he never fails, he never fails. I've been thinking about how I trust in the promises and the faithfulness of God lately. And I started thinking through something in my own life, and I I thought to myself, I've never really been through great tragedy. I've never been through some of the things that, that many of you have faced and so it's, it's, it's easier for me to say that I trust in the promises of God. I've had bad things happen, but, but none that are tragic. It's easy to, to say that you trust in the faithfulness of God and you trust in the promises of God when you don't have to suffer. Within the span of a few weeks, three people connected to our church, a member, a former member, and a son-in-law of a member, have died. According to the lifespan, uh, our average lifespan, all three of these died way too young. And as I've talked with members of these families, I've heard hints of things, and these are all uh, things that we all think when we face these tragedies. Why has this happened? How could a good God allow such a tragedy? To put it another way, How is God faithful when he allows his children, followers of Christ, believers, to suffer? I've been forced to examine my own heart, and I recognize there are moments in my life where I've questioned the faithfulness of God. I've had some people in the last few weeks come up and tell me in all honesty, and I appreciate it. Yeah, I trust that what God does is right, but I don't really like what he does right now. I've been forced to to think through this in my own life. I know what he said, and I know what he's promised, but I want answers. I want answers now. I want to know the bigger plan. I want to know why these things have happened, and I want to be able to make sense of things. See, we've all had moments like this. People say, well, wait, you shouldn't question God. Well, David, a man after God's own heart, did. Psalm 13, how long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I take counsel in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all the day? But notice what he says. Those are verses 1 and 2. Notice what he says in verses 5 and 6. But I have trusted in your steadfast love. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. How do we get from verses 1 and 2 to verses 5 and 6? This is the the question that we've been asking ourselves so many times. How do we get to a point where we're kind of angry with God? And let's be honest, man, we we have been. Let's let's be honest. We've been upset at least, at the very least, of of how God has worked. And maybe not the last few weeks, but, but at some point in your life, if we can all just lay out everything that we believe and everything that we feel, there is without a doubt, there have been times in our lives where we've been upset at how God operates. I'm not here to pretend to be a super saint. I want to be honest with you that we all struggle with dealing with how is God faithful in the midst of such a terrible moment in our lives. 
How do we trust in him? How do we continue to believe in his promises when the world is caving in around us? This passage that we're studying today in our study through the book of Genesis is another example of what happens when we don't trust in the promises of God. And we don't trust in his faithfulness. We're gonna see the damage done when we take our eyes off of God and instead focus on our circumstances. So just to give you a a, a brief build up to this point, Isaac is Abraham's son. The, The Messiah would come through him. He was the chosen heir of Abraham who was chosen of God. And as we all do, Isaac gets older. Now, he's still some years away from dying, um, but his eyes grow dim. He, he, he's, he's hard of, he can't see. He's much older. There's been many years that have passed in between these chapters, and we don't know if, we've, if he's had any more encounters with God, but according to the scripture, we don't see anything written. But we do see that his spiritual life had grown stale. He was a, a gastronome. He was a lover of food. He, he loved game. Now you think about Isaac and the money that he had and the resources that he would have built up, uh, not only from his father's wealth given to him, but also his own wealth. And, and so you can imagine that he probably had a chef. I don't know what they called it in ancient Hebrew. But he probably had people who would go hunt. He loved to hunt, but he probably would have people to go hunt and and come back and prepare his food and serve him his food. So you can imagine what a good life Isaac had. At least according to anyone who loves food, right? He had the desires of the eyes, or in this case, the, the desires of his stomach. That's what fueled him. And in his aging, we will see how Isaac stood against God, that his desire to do his own thing overwhelmed his desire to please God. And so he was, in essence, this is written in here, that food was a big part of Isaac's life. And in the big picture of this, we see a couple things happening. God had chosen Jacob. We've seen this already. Jacob would later be renamed Israel. And according to scripture, God did not choose, or the word that it says in here is God hated Esau. Now in the big picture of things, it's it's not hard to see the imagery happening here. Jacob was God's chosen man, and Israel was God's chosen people, which means Esau was not chosen. And his descendants were the Edomites, bitter enemies of God's people. Genesis 25, 28 says, Isaac loved Esau because he ate of his game, but Rebekah loved Jacob. Just a few verses earlier, we read this. Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you shall be divided. The one shall be stronger than the other. The older shall serve the younger. So Isaac, after, same thing with Abraham, right? After all of the wonderful supernatural experiences that he had, his relationship with God gets stale. Happens with us too, doesn't it? That, that we have these moments in our lives where we feel like that there's, there's some sort of restoration of our spirituality and, and we feel, to, to use a, a, a cliche term, but we feel on fire for the Lord. Maybe you share the gospel with someone and they come to know Christ and you're just pumped up and you just, you just you want to sell everything and move to some faraway country and, and give your life to the, to the work of the gospel. And then two weeks later, you're back to normal, Right? We have this kind of wave of our faith where we we have highs and we have lows and it just constantly keeps going. And Isaac was having this. He experienced the, the, the supernatural wonder of God. God literally spoke to him. But just like his father, it wore off. This is a strange family, isn't it? See, when we're kids, and I remember this as a child, being surprised when I would go to someone else's house and seeing that their family had a different dynamic than mine did. My parents did things a certain way, and we did things a certain way, and I'd go to someone else's house, and I'd hear words that my parents never said. 
Kids would be watching things that my parents didn't let me watch. And I would be surprised. I'd be shocked. I remember most, most actively, my dad would come to every one of my games, whether it was baseball or basketball, and he would cheer me on. I've got videos of him yelling at me through the, the camera microphone, picked them up, and the, can't even enjoy the game because all I hear is my dad yelling at me the whole game. But it was all in love. But I remember something else, and this is the strangest thing why I remember this. There were families that would, dads would never come to a game. Mom would never come to a game. I remember one teammate that I had that the mom would come and sit down on the bleachers and open up a book and never look up from her book the entire game. She would never watch her son play basketball. I saw the damage that some of this did, and I also saw the damage of playing favorites with kids. I've seen it in my friends' lives where you could absolutely see who the favorite kid was. Well, this is happening here. Isaac is not being a good father. Isaac was a, a father who knew better. He had these encounters with God, but he still chose to go his own way. He knew about how Esau sold his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of stew. And so he was determined to give Esau a blessing before he died. And as with so much in Scripture, there are multiple meanings and multiple things that are happening here. He was blind physically, or at least he had difficulty seeing. But this also points to a spiritual condition too, doesn't it? He was blind to his own condition before God. He was blinded by his love for Esau so much that he couldn't even see that God's plan was chosen through Jacob. Couldn't see it. Verses one through four, we see what happens. Now, Isaac knows what's happening. He knows that Jacob is the heir, but yet he's trying to figure out how to give Esau something as well. Look at these verses. When Isaac was old and his eyes were dim so that he could not see, he called Esau, his older son, and said to him, my son, and he answered, here I am. He said, behold, I am old. I do not know the day of my death. Now take your weapons, your quiver, and your bow, and go out to the field and hunt game for me, and prepare for me delicious food such as I love, and bring it to me so that I may eat, that my soul may bless you before I die. He says that he wants to bless Esau with all of his soul. That means every bit of who he was wanted his favored son Esau to receive the blessing. But when you think about it, maybe it's just more than just food. It doesn't say this here, but we can kind of put things together. Knowing our own lives, I don't love my kids just because they make me good food. But there may come a point at which one of my sons is into the same things that I'm interested in. Think about my brother and I. We're totally opposite personalities. And my dad played college basketball. We're we're always texting each other about sports and, and different things. And my brother doesn't really care about sports. So, of course, my dad and I have that connection that he and my brother do not have. Not favorites. But maybe that created a special bond over food. If you love game and your son hunts, that may be your preferred son, huh? But think about this, though. Just in a couple verses before that, it says that Esau made his father and his mother bitter, but Isaac still loved him the most. Esau gave Isaac every reason to reject him, but Isaac remained faithful at great expense to him. We'll soon see this carnage that comes from this kind of favoritism. As in all good stories, what happens next? Rebecca is hiding behind the door, and these are in tents, so it's not hard to hear what someone's saying through a tent wall. So, so listen to this plot that she hears, and now that she concocts. Now Rebecca was listening when Isaac spoke to his son Esau. Now when Esau went to the field to hunt for game and bring it, Rebekah said to her son Jacob, I heard your father speak to your brother Esau. Bring me game and prepare for me delicious food that I may eat it and bless it before the Lord before I die. Now therefore, my son, obey my voice as I command you. Go to the flock and bring me two young good goats so that I may prepare for them delicious food for your father such as he loves. And you shall bring it to your father to eat so that he may bless you before he dies. But Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, Behold, my brother Esau is a hairy man and I am a smooth man. 
Perhaps my father will feel me and I shall seem to be mocking him and bring a curse upon myself and not a blessing. And his mother said to him, let your curse be on me, my son. Only obey my voice and go bring them to me. So he went and took them and brought them to his mother and his mother prepared delicious food such as his father loved. There's a a lot of truth to the old adage and I am a living, breathing example of this that a way to a man's heart is through his stomach. Isaac was no different. Rebecca heard the plot of Isaac and she came up with one of her own. Now, you may have just breezed across this, but this is telling. Do you notice how the passage describes each of the sons? It says that Esau is Isaac's son and Jacob is Rebekah's son. Look at verse five. Now, Rebekah was listening when Isaac spoke to his son. Now, if this is happening in your family, now we joke about that. Wives, you may say to your husbands, hey, your son messed up today. All that means is code word that I don't want to deal with it and you have to. But if this is normal conversation, your family is in conflict. You've you've got divided tribes within your own. We've seen this happen already in Genesis a few times. One person allows sin to take over, and the domino effect of a family crisis begins. And often it's the husband that does not lead well, isn't it? Think think about this. In the garden, what was Adam doing as Satan tempted Eve? Adam stood there silently, did not lead well, did not care for and love his wife well. Abraham did not tell Sarah, no, we're not going to do that when Sarah suggested that they assault Hagar in order to have a child. And here it's Isaac, the the patriarch of the family who plots against his son Jacob. The dominoes have fallen. And I know it seems like I'm saying this in every sermon in Genesis, but I can't stress enough that our actions not only affect us, it has effects on everyone else around us. Your children, your family, your friends, your coworkers, your church are all affected by the choices that you make. Now hear, hear me on this too. This isn't to put a yoke on you. This isn't to put a burden on you. The gospel frees us from the burden of being perfect, but we do have standards. We do have a set of standards found in Scripture alone that govern our behavior. It's not a burden to live in a way that pleases God. In fact, the standards are for our own good. Think about all the times that we've seen this in Genesis. If people only would have remembered that, that God has given us a standard, God has told us what he expects of us, and if we obey that, that doesn't mean our life is smooth sailing, but it does mean that we avoid problems like this. Where one lie becomes one, two lies, which becomes three lies, and after a while it's just out of control. That's what we're seeing here. Think through the sin in Genesis. Think about the impact that those sins have had on others. The biggest one being Adam and Eve, right? I mean, we are all victims of that. That, that Adam's sin was then funneled down to all of us. And so every person who's born is born with the guilt of our father, Adam, and it's given to us so that when we stand before God, we are all guilty. And we contribute to that, certainly, but we all stand guilty with Adam's guilt given to us. Abraham and Sarah's sin led to thousands of years of conflict that are still going on today. See, these aren't just stories. These passages show us humanity's sinfulness and our desperate need for a savior. They also show that sin doesn't just affect us. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to people who said in the middle of their sin that, no, this, is, this only affects me. This doesn't have any impact on anything else. What I do in my own home is my own business. It doesn't have any impact on my family. Every time it does. Every sin, it affects those around us. Now here in this passage, Esau has sinned, Isaac has sinned, and now Rebekah sins. Look at verses 15 through 17. Then Rebekah took the best garments of Esau, her oldest son, which were in, uh, with her in her house, and put them on Jacob, her younger son. And the skins of the young goat she put on his hands and on the smooth part of his neck. And she put the delicious food and the bread which she had prepared into the hand of her son Jacob. 
This is ridiculous. She hears this plot and she says, well, I'm not going to let Isaac get away with this. So she goes and she digs through the closet and she finds clothes that Esau would wear. And because Esau was so hairy and Jacob was not, she, she had uh, calf skins, goat skins, and she put them on his hands and on his neck. Side note, he must have been really hairy if that were. Right. She cooks up some food that smelled like something Esau would have made. This should immediately bring back memories for you of Sarah telling Abraham, listen, see the similarities that this is not People are not learning from their descendants or their, their people who've lived before them. Behold now, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Go into my servant. It may be that I shall obtain children by her. Sneaky. Sinful behavior. Abraham did exactly what she says. And in this passage, Jacob stands there. I know it's her mom or it's his mom, but he stands there silently and does exactly what she says. Both stories show people who are not satisfied with what God had given to them and what God had promised to them. They did not trust that God would do what he said he would do. Both stories illustrate this. Both stories show people who believe that they needed to help God along in his plan. I want to bring it to you for a second. Have you ever been guilty of this? I've asked you this before. Have you ever been guilty of, of, of one, not trusting God's plan, but two, trying to do things to, to help God move a little faster? I mean, it's ridiculous, isn't it? That we would even believe this, but our actions show that we do believe this, that we do often want God to move in different ways and quicker. See, all I know is ministry. For, for most of my adult life, I've been in ministry of, of some form, so I don't understand a lot of other references in terms of business. I have worked in the business world, but for not very long. And I know ministry, so I'll, I'll give you this example from my own life and from the life as a pastor of a church. Churches will often see growth as something that they have to have. Entire industries have been created for church growth. There's conferences, there are books, there are resources available for how to make your church grow. I understand this point. You want people to know Jesus. You want people to come and join with you. You want people to be part of a fellowship that you feel like is encouraging and beneficial. 100% agree with that. But what I see and what I've seen personally so often is this, that churches make growth their main driver. Which means we're going to do everything we have to do to get more people to come. And so what happens when God doesn't bring those people? Or maybe the growth isn't as fast as we preferred. Now they won't say they're doing this, but I've seen it. Many churches will kind of close the Bible and adopt practices from other parts of the world and say, how can we attract people? How can we get people to come and join with us? Well, they forget that any person who walks through these doors is not brought on their own. God's drawing them. God's bringing them to this church and to any church. Decades ago, the trend was a church that church grow through programs. Then church membership was ignored or abandoned. Marketing took hold of pastors, so they modeled their leadership and their decision-making after Fortune 500 CEOs. Entertainment took over worship. And rather than congregational singing, performance took over. Churches dimmed their lights and shined the lights on professionals on stage who are the best singers, the best looking, the best dressed. Their motives are good. They want to see people to recognize who Jesus is and come to Christ. But rather than following the standards that are clear in Scripture of worship and church life, many have bought into marketing and entertainment. Now, how does this reference back to the passage? All this to help God just a little bit. Yeah, God, we, we, we know what your standard is, but you know what? 
man, if we just do this, this, and this, we're going to have more people come. So they kind of set aside the Bible. They set aside God's standard in order to help God bring more people. You see how dangerous this could be. It's a pattern that I've seen multiple times. It's a pattern that I'm seeing in Genesis. See, in application for us today, I don't know anyone in my life, maybe you have, who's ever sold their birthright. I don't even know how you would even do that. I don't know anybody who is going to kill wild game and bring it to their father. and do. I don't, I don't know anybody who does that stuff. Tricking blind parents. Outside of Genesis 27, I've never seen that. I am concerned, though, that the same sinful pattern that we're seeing in Genesis has affected the church, not just this church, but church in general, in the exact same way. So many believers are not satisfied with God. They're not satisfied with his timing or what he's doing. And so instead, we take our eyes off of God's standard and we push ourselves to help God move a little faster. It's ridiculous that we would do this, but every single one of us does. Our responsibility to God is never to help him move along. It's to be obedient and trusting and to follow after him. But here, no one seems to be doing that. Not here, but in here. In Genesis 27, no one understands this. It's Jacob's turn now to do something deceitful. He's already done it once, and now he's going to do it again. Look at verses 18 through 23. So he went into his father and said, my father, and he said, here I am. Who are you, my son? Jacob said to his father, I am Esau, your firstborn. I've done as you told me. Now sit up and eat of my game that your soul may bless me. But Isaac said to his son, how is it that you found so quickly, my son? He answered, because the Lord, your God, granted me success. Then Isaac said to Jacob, please come near that I may feel you, my son, to know whether you are really my son Esau or not. So Jacob went near to Isaac, his father, who felt him and said, the voice is Jacob's voice, but the hands are the hands of Esau. And he did not recognize him because his hands were hairy like his brother Esau's hands, so he blessed him. Jacob lied to his father three times. The first of these lies comes when he says that he was Esau. The second comes in verse 20 when Jacob says that God has given him the success. So not only did he lie to his father, he blasphemed here. He was attributing to God something that God was not part of. That's blasphemy. And the final lie is found in verse 24. He says, are you really my son, Esau? He answered, I am. Then he said, bring it near to me that I may eat of my son's game and bless you. So he brought it near to him and he ate. And he brought him wine and he drank. Do you see how the sin keeps moving and snowballing? It doesn't stop. When we allow sin, and this is, this is part of the church, by the way. If you didn't realize this, this is why God has given the church elders and why God has given the church congregational oversight. So ultimately, the elders are not the ultimate authority in the church. You as a church body are. This is why. So to protect us from allowing a little bit of sin in, because when a little bit of sin comes in, it means there's a whole lot more coming. And so the church is called to deal with sin, to get rid of sin, to eliminate it as best we can so that the church can remain pure. Because if sin filters into a church, we know that it's not just one. It's multiple, multiple sins. It's like when you see an ant. If you see one, there's a bunch of them around. And so God has given us the church to protect us from situations like this. Family is not dealing with this correctly. We tell one lie or deceptive in a way, and it rarely stops there. It gets bigger and bigger and more complex and more sinister. It's easy to tell a lie after you've told one, isn't it? It becomes normal. And the more we do something, the more normal it becomes. So a horrible family situation is actually pretty normal for them because we've seen that they're Family members have done the same thing. Abraham and Sarah, horrible stuff happening. And now their son Isaac and Rebecca, same story. Isaac, in his bad vision, accepts that it's his son Esau. The voice doesn't quite match, but the food he brought and the hair on his body makes him comfortable that he's visiting with Esau. 
Isaac tells his son, come, come near and, and give me a kiss. And Isaac smells the garments, giving him the assurance that it was, in fact, his beloved Esau. And then Isaac gives a blessing to Jacob, though it was meant for Esau. He says this, see, the smell of my son is as the smell of a field that the Lord has blessed. May God give you the dew of heaven and the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Let the people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. In this blessing, Isaac, who he's, again, thinking that it's Esau, but he's giving this blessing to his other son, Jacob, he promises prosperity, he promises the land and all that it produces. Ignoring God's word again, he promises protection and power. See, Isaac thinks he's fixed this problem. Yeah, yeah. God, I know, I know what you've done with Jacob, I know that, but man, Esau... What about him? God says, no, Jacob is the one. I says, okay. He turns and he tries to give the blessing to Esau. He tries to, to, to give it to him, but again, we see God's providence. It's given to the right person. And this is what happens in verses 30 through 40. We, saw Esau, we see Esau's defeat. As soon as Isaac had finished blessing Jacob, when Jacob had scarcely gone out from the presence of Isaac, his father, Esau, his brother, came in from hunting. He also prepared delicious food and brought it to his father. And he said to his father, let my father arise and eat of his son's game that you may bless me. His father Isaac said to him, who are you? He answered, I'm your son, your firstborn Esau. Then Isaac trembled very violently and said, who was it then that hunted game and brought it to me? And I ate it all before you came and I have blessed him. Yes, and he shall be blessed. Esau, clueless, had no idea what was happening here. He was told by his father to go out, bring him food, and he did exactly what his father said. Isaac is shocked. He says, who are you? What, what, what's happening right now? And it wasn't just kind of like a little shake. It was a violent tremor. He... Anytime you've been given bad news, news that devastates you, you know how some people say, I think you need to sit down before we have this conversation? Why? Because you lose absolute control of, of your body and you, you'll shake or you'll fall or you'll pass out or you'll faint. And this is what's happening with Isaac. He thought he figured this out. He thought he had helped God enough, but instead now he's finding out that he's not gonna win this one. And so he shakes and Esau screams, he cries out with an exceedingly great and bitter cry. And he says to his father, bless me, even me also, O my father. But Isaac says, your brother came deceitfully and he has taken away your blessing. Esau says, is, it not rightfully, is he not rightfully named Jacob? For he has cheated me these two times. He took away my birthright and behold, now he's taken away my blessing. Isaac is shaking, Esau is yelling. They, they figure out what's happening here, that, that Jacob has gotten him again. And notice in verse 36, it says, is he not rightly named Jacob, for he has cheated me these two times. Now, if you don't know Hebrew, um, this is a, a strange statement, at least in English. In verse 35, Esau uses a word that we translate as deceit. In verse 36, Esau plays on his Jacob's name and uses a different Hebrew word that sounds a little bit like the name Jacob. So what he's saying is, is, is it not right that Jacob, but he doesn't say the name Jacob, he uses a, another word, again, that sounds like Jacob, but it just means cheater. Is it not right that he's named cheater because he's done this to me two times? He's being sarcastic. And then he says, have you not reserved a blessing for me? He's realizing that he's got nothing at this point. And Isaac says this, Behold, I have made him Lord over you and all his brothers. I have given to him for his servants. And with grain and wine, I have sustained him. What then can I do for you, my son? And Esau said to the father, Have you but one blessing, my father? Bless me, even me also, O my father. And Esau lifted up his voice and wept. Isaac, Esau begs Isaac for a blessing. 
He's weeping over the the future that awaits him. And then Isaac, his father, answered and said to him, Behold, away from the fatness of the earth shall your dwelling be, and away from the dew of heaven on high. By your sword you shall live, and you shall serve your brother. But when you grow restless, you shall break his yoke from your neck. What a terrible blessing. What a terrible statement to give to your son. The blessing has already been given to Jacob, and Esau is left with nothing. No one comes in this story, no one comes out looking good, do they? Of the four characters, the four people that we see, each person tries to help God along so that they could get what they wanted. That they could have things their own way, that things would come out their way and in their favor. And what happens? Each of the four suffer. They all suffered, and God got what he willed. Seems like Jacob got what he wanted, but just in a few chapters, what happens? Jacob is tricked by Laban. He gets his comeuppance. But God always has had a plan. Isaac returns to faith in God. Jacob would become Israel. Now, it's easy to read this account and to think this is something from some dysfunctional family in the ancient world that that we really don't relate to, that there's not anything in this passage that we can apply because, I mean, this is really strange. There are all sorts of, uh, of things that cause us to doubt the goodness of God, though, aren't there? We want to help God along. We, we want the promises and we want them now. We may not be guilty of the, the heinous acts that we've seen from these ancient people, but sin infects us the same way. Look at what Paul says in 2 Timothy 2. He says this, if we have died with him, we also live with him. If we endure, we also reign with him. If we deny him, he will deny us. So the first two statements give us comfort, don't they? If we have died with him, he will also, we will also live with him. And if we endure, he will also, we will also reign with him. And then a warning comes. If we deny him, he will also deny us. Now, without reading forward in this, what do you think happens next? The next statement says, if we are faithless. Based on the first three, we would say, well, he was unfaithful to us. But that's not what it says. This is how we would respond to someone. If someone is faithless towards us, we will be unfaithful to them. God says, if you are unfaithful, I am still faithful. These four people in chapter Genesis 27 did everything they could to hurry the blessing and all they experienced was pain. If someone did that to us, if someone treated us like we treat God, we would be done with those people. We would eliminate them from our lives. Nothing to do with them. But God doesn't do that. This is the gospel. God doesn't do that. In fact, God does the exact opposite. God makes promises to humanity and we either don't believe them or we reject God's timing so we try to get what we want, when we want it, and how we want it. In essence, we're pushing God aside. But instead of doing what we would all do ourselves, God comes to us. We run away from the goodness of God. We try to squirm out of his grip. We try to get away from God as fast as we can. Now, we won't admit that, but in essence, we do. Our sin causes us to go away from God. There's a a story, a play that I remember, and I don't remember much from church because I was too busy getting in trouble, but I do remember... um, this group that came in uh, from Liberty University and they were doing a tour and they would sing, you know, typical corny early 90s songs and, and they did a, a performance and maybe you've seen this where um, the character's playing Jesus. They always got the guy with the long hair and the beard to play Jesus. And so they, they got that guy here and then they had the main character and the main character's walking around and going to parties and, and going to school and he's nice, he's nice to have Jesus around, right? And High fives and all that stuff. And Jesus is standing and everywhere the guy turns, Jesus is right there. Until the guy goes somewhere where he knows that he shouldn't be. And he, he's partying and having a fun time and he turns around and Jesus is standing there. And so the guy says, Jesus, can you give me a moment? 
Can you, can you give me some space? I want to do this. And so the guy goes back to the party and he turns around and he's getting more angry with Jesus' presence. And so he turns around and says, look, I need you to leave me alone for a little bit. And he turns back around and he's partying and then he turns around and his anger on his face, you can see it. And so the character grabs the character of Jesus and spreads his arms out and starts hammering his feet and hammering his hands. Silence in the room. And I remember I can tell you exactly where I was. Not many things I can do this for, but I remember sitting right there and, and the, the, the character looks out at the crowd and, and they're acting, of course, and he says, what are you looking at? You do this every day. The point being is that we try to get away from Jesus. We try to, to, to have him there when we need him. We need a personal buddy Jesus. We like that one. We like the Jesus who gives us what we want and gets us out of bad situations, but we do not like the Jesus that confronts us. We do not like the Jesus who says, you need to die to yourself. You need to die to your sin to follow me. Lose your life so that you can gain it. We don't like that. We don't like the Jesus that sets standards for our way of living. We don't like that Jesus. And so we run away from that Jesus, and what does God do? God runs to us. God comes to us. When we doubt the goodness of God, remember that instead of doing what we do, God became man to live and die in our place. God in the flesh. Jesus became man so that he could live for us and die for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Let me rephrase that in terms of this passage in my sermon. While we were running away, Jesus chased us down. This is the thing that we need to remember so much when we see so much unfaithfulness in Scripture and so much unfaithfulness in our life that God has always been faithful, so faithful to the point that he chased us to rescue us. When you doubt the goodness of God, read these accounts in Genesis. You see people abusing other image bearers. You see killing others. You see lying, cheating, and stealing. And then I want you to see what God does at every single turn. We are unfaithful, but God has always been faithful. Would you pray with me?